The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome to this service of worship at University Baptist Church. Uh, we are grateful that you are with us, that you're choosing to be with us this morning as we worship together. Um, a few announcements this morning. Uh, as we move into this week, we want to remind you of a few things. First of all, on Tuesdays and Thursdays this week, uh, we began opening our sanctuary back up for a couple hours each day from 11 to 1 so that you could come uh, and sit here in the sanctuary, uh, pray, reflect, take time out of your schedule uh, to just come and sit and be. Uh, Kat and I are here in the building during that time as well, so you can come down the hall and find us. We'd love to talk with you, uh, pray with you, have conversation, um, what have you. So Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 to 1. Um, on Wednesday night, uh, we've concluded our Theo Ed Talk series. If you missed any of those videos, we've posted all of them in our Facebook group. You can go back and watch them there. But this Wednesday, we'll be turning our attention uh, to our monthly business meeting. Uh, so members of the church, we strongly encourage you to join us there. Uh, we'll be looking over uh, all the things that are going on in the life of the church. We'll be looking at uh, our, our finances, uh, all the things that are going around in the church. And so we encourage you to be there so that we can bring you up to date on all of that. Um, as, a, as we lead into that business meeting, we'd also remind you that while we're not passing the plates, you can always give online. Uh, we've had several really wonderful months uh, of giving. You've been incredibly generous uh, set for several months, and we've been able to do some really great things. Uh, we've been able to make some wonderful gifts to some important organizations who've been doing a lot of great work in the midst of the pandemic to Delta Hands for Hope, to Edward Street, and others. Uh, and we can only do that uh, when you give and give generously out of what you have out of what God has given you. So we encourage you to continue to do so so that we can continue uh, to have those things to celebrate and continue to have that work to do and uh, be able to support people who are doing wonderful work during this time. Uh, in September, we'll be starting some new Wednesday night classes as well. So look forward for some more information about those. Uh, all this is gonna keep happening on Zoom. Um, and so you've got the link in our weekly updates. If you're not on our weekly updates, I encourage you to go to our website uh, where you can sign up for those or give us a call here in the office and we'll get you signed up for those as well. Um, and with that, let us prepare our hearts and minds for this hour of worship. Now I invite all of our children to gather around the screen for the blessing of the backpacks this morning. Good morning, children. Not all heroes wear capes. We've been saying that and will be saying that all throughout this sermon series, but today we are presenting you with UBC capes because you are UBC heroes. And even if you don't need a cape, it can't help to have a reminder. You are heroes when you are kind, when you listen, when you share, when you are generous, and when you love one another. This place is so grateful for you. We learn from you all the time, and we are praying for you as you go back to school whether it be online, in the school, or in home. We are praying for this new year. We know it's different, but we know you will do well. You are our heroes. And first graders, congratulations to you. As you move up this year, we will present you with your new Bibles. This is the Deep Blue Kids Bible. It's an exploration of God's stories. And we hope that you and your parents will read through it together and discover new and wonderful things about the God that we serve, the God who made us, and the God who loves us the God who teaches us just what it means to be a hero. So you'll be getting some packages in the mail, expect those, and you will be getting prayers from this entire congregation as you, as you start a new school year. Let's begin with prayer now. 
God, we give you thanks for the children of University Baptist Church, and we pray that as they begin this new school year, you would be at work in them, Lord, reminding them what it means to be kind, generous, and loving. We pray, Lord, for all that they will encounter, for all that they may miss, and we pray, Lord, that you would be at work in them through it all. Amen. call to worship. If you do not have a worship guide in front of you, your response will be, not all heroes wear capes. Join me now. Not all heroes wear capes, but all heroes put God's love into action. As God actively loves the world, we are called to actively love each other. Not all heroes wear capes. Some pull us out of danger with a gentle nudge. Not all heroes wear capes. Some wait and watch for God to appear. Not all heroes wear capes. Some help us to grieve in the midst of pain. Not all heroes wear capes. Some simply carry us when we need help. Not all heroes wear capes. Some come and sit with us, reminding us to love one another. Not all heroes wear capes, but all heroes put God's love into action. Let us pray. God, we pray this morning as we enter into worship that you would come into this space, into our hearts and our minds. Lord, be at work as we hear your word. And help us, Lord, to be expectant that you might answer our prayers. Help us, Lord, to pray, believing that you will show up. Help us, Lord, in our daily walk to trust that you are with us and doing a good work in this world. Amen. 
Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Luke chapter 24. I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please join me in singing the three verses of Open My Eyes That I May See that are listed in the worship guide. together, but we are still called to be generous and to be grateful. And so now as Taylor and Lay offer this musical meditation, I encourage you to think about how you might give to this place, how you might be generous in your giving. Here 
Each time I stand to wonder at the vastness of the sea, I know that there are mysteries too great and deep for me. The wide expanse of water reaches far beyond my sight, and yet I know.
With uh, Kat's reading from this morning, you may be thinking uh, that it's Easter Sunday here, but we know very well that uh, August the 16th is not Easter Sunday. Um, But that passage does lead well into our New Testament reading for the day uh, for our look at another unsung hero, our second unsung hero. Um, Today we'll be looking uh, at Rhoda. And we hear uh, about and hear from Rhoda in Acts chapter 12. I will be reading verses 6 through 17. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him saying, Get up quickly, and the chains fell off his wrists. The angel said to him, Fasten your belt and put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went outside and walked along the lane, when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. When he knocked at the outer gate, a maid named Rhoda came to answer. On recognizing Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hand to be silent and described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he added, tell this to James and to the believers. Then he left and went out to another place. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. For months and for years, people have been speaking out. They've been out in the streets claiming their truth, sharing their love, their witness, and their reinterpretation of the movement of history, their way of seeing the world that's distinctly different from those who've clung to power for so long, for a long time, and used their power and privilege to silence different voices uh, with whom they didn't agree. An authoritarian leader has done uh, his best to stoke fear by sending his troops out to seize those who don't hold him in high regard, throwing some of them in jail. Some have even died standing up in the face of the anger and fear that this tyrant has stoked. Their deaths have fueled a movement. Through it all, the numbers who have heard uh, what those in the streets have been saying who have seen themselves, seen themselves in those who have died, haven't shrunk. Their numbers haven't shrunk. Their numbers have grown. Their numbers continue to grow. The message of this movement is spreading beyond uh, the places we might all assume that it would spread, and there's reason to believe that it's going to keep spreading further. In the midst of it all, those with means 
uh, have continued to do what they've always done with a little change, maybe a little inconvenience to their, to our daily lives. Those with less means, those who've not always known what tomorrow might bring, those uh, who have depended on uh, every paycheck to make ends meet, who've been unable to step back from or stay out of harm's way, haven't been as lucky. For some, their work has required them to continue going, to continue being there in person, to go to work regardless of all that's going on out in the streets and around town, to choose between showing up for work or being out of work. They've been deemed essential, these folks have been deemed essential. For some, they've had to choose among health and safety and freedom and knowing that never at once could they have all three. Those who've been out there on the front lines have seen what's possible. They've seen what's capable of making a difference. They've seen things that will fundamentally change the conversation that those who sit comfortably behind closed doors are having. But sadly, what they've witnessed, what they've seen, what they know is possible, what's capable of changing everything in front of them is being ignored and is being dismissed. Few, if any, believe those who've seen these things, who've witnessed them. No matter how loudly or how clearly they demand uh, to be heard, no matter how loudly or clearly those who have been deemed essential have insisted, their insistence has only been met with resistance. The words and actions of the comfortable only change when what's happening out there, when what's moving through the air shows up at their doorstep. And even then, they're not quick with words of thanks and appreciation to those who came and first told them about what is happening. What they've seen is possible. Their dismissal continues as they then try to hurry on back to hear how things might get back to normal as soon as possible. And once again, to see those whom they've missed seeing for so long, to getting back to doing the things that they know how to do, that they love doing, and being with all those that they love. This is Rhoda's world. It might sound to you, it might sound to us a lot like our world, but this is also Rhoda's world. It's really easy to read this story we just read from the book of Acts. It's turning point in Acts, the beginning of the pivot from Peter to Paul and no less at Mary's house and miss Rhoda altogether. She's so excited she forgets to do the one thing she should do to help Peter and let him in the gate. And after that, she doesn't say much. And even when she does speak, she's ignored. And then she's gone. We hear no more from Rhoda. We see Rhoda no more in the book of Acts. The first woman to speak in the book of Acts is silenced in an instant so that Peter can tell a story of how God is at work. So he can tell those who are gathered at Mary's house and the others that he is in fact out of prison and that they should go and tell James and the other believers. But nothing in this story is possible. God's movement in this story uh, struggles to be seen, to be witnessed, to be understood without Rhoda. Like most people who find themselves uh, being the ones who are there to open the doors and close the doors and, and sweep the mats and clean the pots, Rhoda keeps Mary's house running so that things like happen in today's story can happen, so that the church can, can continue to gather there. I'm sure we can all think of someone in our own lives like Rhoda, someone we can point to as a person who keeps the ships running, our homes, our offices, our schools, whatever the case may be. I'm sure we can all think of a Rhoda. A friend of mine from college recently lost his Rhoda. Her name was Miss Smith. She was the custodian at the elementary school where he began his career in education. She was the first friend he made when he moved to a new town, and she helped him in countless ways those first years. He has untold numbers of stories about the ways that Miss Smith impacted his life. Most importantly to him, though, she kept him in line, and, and she wasn't afraid to overstep any perceived boundaries 
between the two of them, her a custodian and him a teacher, when she especially wasn't afraid to overstep those boundaries, uh, when she thought that he needed to hear some unvarnished truth. So much so that to this day, my friend says that the first piece of advice that he gives all the new teachers that he sees in his district, all the new teachers that he encounters wherever he goes, the first piece of advice he gives them is to make friends with the custodian because it can make your life better. And no one has ever told him that he was wrong for that advice. Ms. Smith was his rota. The rota that I can think of is a man named Al. Uh, Al was uh, the head of maintenance and security at a church that I was a part of uh, years ago. He had a key ring the size of a dinner plate. If it hit you in the leg, it'd probably do some big damage. And I know that he had keys to places in that building and probably elsewhere uh, that none of us knew about. None of us knew existed, but he knew exactly with one flip of that key ring which key to get to get you into any door that you needed to, to get you anywhere that you needed to go. His mind was incredible, but more so was his heart. His spirit was equal parts welcome and focus, and he was exactly who you would want to be in charge of maintenance and security if you needed someone to be in charge of those things for you. So Al, Miss Smith, Rhoda, uh, these folks, whomever you're thinking about, whoever's popped into your mind as we've thought about this, these are all saints in a litany of overlooked individuals who do thankless work for thankless wages and often hear thankless words from those of us who are coming up and down and through the houses and prayer rooms of our own lives. And in worlds that echo each other 2,000 years apart, that are in desperate need of individuals to show us a way forward, these folks are here to do so. They're here to guide us if we'll just stop for a second and pay attention to them and believe what they have to tell us. These folks remind us of what being a hero really looks like. And they give us a window into how to build a world that doesn't require heroic actions to solve problems. If we look back at the story in Acts, nothing that Rhoda does is anything we'd call heroic. If we read Rhoda's story in the context of a, a, a comic book or a superhero novel or anything, we wouldn't think what she was doing is heroic. She's just doing her job. She's going through her daily tasks when she hears Peter's voice. And she does what any of us would do. She runs to tell her employer. Someone's at the gate. Someone that she wants, uh, that they probably want to see. And she insists that she's telling the truth. And when she's finally proven correct, Peter's let in the gate. Like the one thing that might be construed as heroic that Rhoda does, letting Peter in herself and taking Peter uh, with her up to where Mary and the others are gathered, is the one thing that she doesn't do. We've already said this, but she's not shuttered up behind closed doors with those who've gathered for church. She's, not, she's out in the courtyard between the home and the street. She's working. She's living her life. She's doing daily tasks. She's close to both the streets and the home, but she's not in either one. She's in the middle of life when she realizes exactly who it is that has arrived and exactly what it means that Peter has showed up at the gate. She recognizes Peter by his voice. She paid attention and she was mindful throughout her time there at Mary's. She would have to be, to be able to recognize Peter only by his voice. She, she paid attention to all those who came and went, who were in and out of Mary's house. She's showing here, albeit in a short story, a short amount of time, she's showing here how attentive she is. And she's also showing how persistent she is. I imagine... It's not very becoming of a servant, of a maid in first century Jerusalem to disagree with the one whom she serves. But Rhoda does it anyway because of what she's seen. She knows she's right, and she's willing to assert herself even in the face of their disbelief. Rhoda's present. Rhoda's uh, attentive. 
Rhoda is persistent. It's wonderful that she is all these things. But she shouldn't have to be. No one outside the gathered community should have to be the one who's there to tell the church what God is doing in their midst, what their God is capable of accomplishing. No one should have to insist to us, no one should have to insist to the gathered community that the very thing the church has gathered to pray for, the very person who they've gathered to pray for, uh, for whose safety and release they have asked and pined for, no one should have to tell them that he is at the door. No one should have to insist on telling them to believe her when she says that he is at the door. She shouldn't have to force them to believe that their prayers have been answered. She shouldn't have to persuade them to come down and see for themselves. If they were willing to pray for those things, if they believed that their prayers might work, that God might hear them, that God might make a way where it seems like there is none, then they should run down the stairs at the first sound of Peter's name. But Rhoda is not the first woman uh, to not be believed in the New Testament. The disciples don't believe uh, the women who arrive at the tomb to find it empty, to hear that, in fact, what Jesus had told them earlier, that he would be risen, that he would be going on, uh, had, in fact, happened. They didn't believe the very thing that Jesus told them would happen had happened. But it did. And the very same thing is happening again here today in Acts. Peter, who's been left for dead, is alive and well and at the door. People in Rhoda's position are often asked to do things they shouldn't have to do. Right now, in, in our world, We are asking teachers and students and nurses and doctors and meat packers and Amazon workers and grocery store cashiers and everyone else whose work we've deemed as essential to keep things running according to our sense of normalcy shouldn't have to do some of the things that they are doing. But they're doing them anyway, and we are rightfully calling them heroic because of it. But should they have to be the heroes of the story? Should we have to rely upon heroic efforts for people going beyond what is required of them for us to care for one another, to simply care for one another, to to, to build a world that works for us all? Rhoda's world, Rhoda's story, echoes our own. It echoes many of the stories that we hear about today of folks who are uh, risking things to go to work, who are there doing heroic work that if we might do things differently, they wouldn't have to do. But it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to ask people who are underpaid and underfunded and overworked and overlooked to do things that we think are heroic because we can't do the simple things that we're asked to do to make this world the world that God calls us to make it. And I'm not just talking about wearing masks and keeping our distance and thinking about others before we think about ourselves and thinking about the ways that what we do impacts others' lives. I'm talking about doing what Rhoda does. I've already said it, she's present, She's in the moment. She's aware of what's happening around her. She's not distracted by other things. She is very present where she is. And she's attentive. She's aware of who's been coming in and out of Mary's house, the flow of people, who they are, what they are, what they do, what they sound like, their influence, their connections to each other, their relationships. She can, in an instant, know by someone's voice that something they thought was impossible is possible. And she knows then what needs to be done. And she's persistent, as we've said as well. Even those who have some power over her don't believe her. And even because of that, she doesn't uh, give in to them. 
Even though they dismiss her, she stays firm in her, in her convictions. Once they insist that she's crazy, she presses on to convince them that what she's seen and heard is true. Earlier I told you about Al, my Rhoda. What I didn't tell you is that Al's job as the head of maintenance and security, part of Al's job as maintenance and security, uh, existed only because of a terrible tragedy. And if I've told you this story before, I'm sorry. But one Sunday morning, some 30 years earlier, a man who was rather unstable, who had been outcast by our society, who didn't have much to his name, uh, at the conclusion of the morning worship service that Sunday, he showed up outside the door, and as someone who was in need of something that he could sell or use to get money or to get food or, or whatever it was that he needed, he tried to snatch a necklace off a woman's neck, and in doing so, the force sliced her neck and she was sent to the hospital, and it created this enormous sense of fear in that church community. And so, as the fear mounted, the church uh, created a security team and Al became the head of it. And his job was to keep the church safe. His job was to watch the doors and to make sure uh, that only those who needed to come in came in and to keep out those who didn't need to be in there. And Al uh, saw to that job unwaveringly and he was lauded for his work and everyone heaped praise upon him for what he did. But there was this constant Paul hanging over the conversation of did we really need to have a security team at the church? So fast forward 20 years and a generation of kids uh, who didn't know that story, who hadn't been told that story, or at least who weren't aware of that story in the church's history, began to wonder how they could make a difference. How instead of driving, simply driving into town to come to church and leaving that building and that property and that space when it was time to go to lunch, how they could make some connections, rebuild some trust, how they could take the church outside the walls. And Al was all for it. So they started inviting the homeless guys who hung out down the street who hung out at the library around the corner. They started inviting all the folks who stayed at the shelters in town to come over to the church and have breakfast, sometimes to come over and have lunch. And first, they were picnics on the lawn outside the church. And then there were meals inside. And then it expanded to dental screenings and health screenings. And before you knew it, these strangers who were afraid of each other, these strangers who had tried to keep themselves separate from each other, were getting to know each other. They knew each other by name. They knew who each other was and what each other's struggles were. They became more than simply people who passed on the street or who crossed to the other side of the street so they didn't, wouldn't have to have a conversation. They became a different kind of community. And through that all, the church came down out from where it was meeting, came out from behind closed doors, and saw God's work for itself on the streets and in the grass and everywhere beyond the building. And instead of being a bouncer for part of his job, Al's job became more of a crossing guard, right? Giving directions, waving people through, having conversations with whomever came into the building, whoever came by the church. It was things that fit Al's skill set more. Al got to be Al. I think if we can learn to be more present, to be more attentive, to be more persistent in the ways that Rhoda shows us she is, then we too can show others just exactly what God is capable of doing in the world in and through us in the ways that Rhoda shows the church who's gathered at Mary's house that Peter is alive and well. If we can learn to do those things, we can build a world where people are no longer underpaid and overworked, but capable of living and thriving and doing what they love. We can build a world where we develop creative solutions to complex problems with grace and forgiveness instead of judgment and anxiety. So this week, wherever you find yourselves, be present. Whoever you find yourselves with, whether they're in person, whether it's on Zoom, wherever it may be, you find yourself in the presence of other people, pay attention. Be mindful of the, the ways it is that you're able to gather, the ways that it is that we're able uh, to do the things that we love to do. 
be pay attention. Be present, be attentive, and be persistent. When we know how we've seen God moving in the world and others don't see it, be persistent in showing how it is that we know what is possible, what God is possible doing, what we can see God doing if we are comfortable enough to come down or come out from wherever we are and see the ways that God is working in the world. If we can do that, and we can build a world where Rhoda is free to be Rhoda, where we're all free to be who God called us to be, without fear, without anxiety, without, without any of the troubles uh, that surround us these days. If we can do those things, we can build that kind of world. I think that's the kind of, God, kind of world that God wants us to build. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, help us like Rhoda to be expectant as we wait for you. Give us ears to recognize you at work. Give us courage like Rhoda to give witness to your activity and overwhelm us with joy at what you can and will do among us. Lord, trusting in your word, in your works, and in your grace, we pray the words that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I will not drown in shallow water, not with your love within my reach. I did not come this far to falter and will not rest until I'm free. You are the sun, you are the flower, you are the wind across the sea And I will kneel here at your altar And pray you take my soul to keep Oh precious one You are the mountain You are the earth Beneath my feet In you As always, it's good to be with you. It's been good to worship with you again here at University Baptist Church. If you're just finding out about this place, if you're just coming to know about us here, uh, I encourage you to look us up on our website, ubchm.org. Uh, there you can find contact information for all of us here. Reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk with you more about this place, uh, about the many ways that we are uh, at work in our community. Uh, and the many ways that you can plug into the life here at this church. Again, we give thanks for you taking time to be with us this morning, and I invite you now to join me in our commission and blessing. Your response will be, again, not all heroes wear capes. Not all heroes wear capes, but all heroes put God's love into action. As God actively loves the world, we are called to actively love each other. Not all heroes wear capes. And now may God give us the grace to never sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big for something good. 
Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take our eyes and see through them, our minds and think through them, and our hearts and set them on fire. Amen.